I actually did that song. Very happy. One of the few ones I know. But uh, at this time, I'm going to introduce Edwin Marshall uh, to make our presentation on plans, and we'll get to hear some more of that sweet music. Mr. Marshall. What old David? Don't go. Uh -huh. You know, I was standing there and I uh, always enjoyed presenting this class. And one of the things that I, uh, for those of you here from Old Mogi, what we have here is a gathering of people with Muskogee background. Some of them are Seminole, some of them's Creek. We got, we've had Cherokees, we got some Kiowas, and they're married into Creek families and. But they're uh, familiar with our uh, language, and uh, just to let you know, kind of where this, uh, why why we're doing this way up here in Oklahoma City, uh, and I get Facebook my whole. I I, uh, I started a Muskogee Creek Word of the Day uh, uh, page on Facebook, and uh, it kind of grew, and it took off, and uh, today I've got nearly six thousand people that are connected to that Muskogee Creek Word of the Day, and uh, a lady in uh, Georgia, or Tennessee, she's the one that took it off of my page and said, let's create a page just for Muskogee Creek Word of the Day, and we did. So uh, today we've got 5,700 people that are connected to Muskogee Creek Word of the Day. And from that, uh, David Frank was uh, got connected to it, and uh, David said, you know, I'd like to do something around the Oklahoma City area. There's a lot of people in Oklahoma City that's connected to that Facebook site. He said, I'd like to have some actual language lessons and uh, here in Oklahoma City because there's a lot of people in Oklahoma City that want, they, they want to hear the language spoken and they want to learn how to uh, speak that language and if nothing else, to learn how to pronounce the words and things like that. If you're a speaker, Nancy, I know you're a speaker, uh, first language speaker, my whole life. That was our first language. I'm a first language speaker. Reality is that we're probably not going to create any fluent speakers, but we're going to help keep our language going by teaching the words and things like that, phrases. And, uh, moment. And it's good because young people, they're, you know, Seminole Nation, Creek Nation, they're teaching our youngsters how to speak now. And like I said, we may not reach the fluency that we, you and I had when we were small, but, and our parents had, but at least we're going to keep our language going. So that's how we got started up here, and David uh, introduced himself to me, and I never met him before. And David, and uh, so David, as he, he introduced himself, you all know that he's got a lot of folks back home. Uh, Spencer Frank, I was in Ishtiatumas, that's David's uncle. And uh, David's uh, aunt, I believe, George Thompson, hey, well, that's his aunt, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, so David's got a lot of connections back home. I always say this. There's no creek and no Seminole. Creek is an English word. Seminole, that's a Spanish word. We speak one language. So when we teach the language, we teach the Muscogee language. And so that's how we got started. Um, and so the uh, group that's sitting over here, they've been coming faithfully and they've been... Uh, uh, learning some words and learning some phrases and, and we've been getting together and having potluck dinner and, and basically socializing, you know, bringing the Muskogees together in Oklahoma City area. And that's always good because there's, there's still a lot more up here that say they want to come, they just, maybe well, I'll come next time, I couldn't make it this time, but there's a lot up here. And so uh, I got a lot of relatives even up here in Oklahoma City uh, that uh, uh, love the language. So anyway, that's how we got started. And, and one of the most basic things that we do is, uh, and I think it's important, if you're going to learn how to read the language, 
if you're going to understand the written word and see it, is uh, you got to know what the alphabet says. That's the that's the primary thing about the written Muscogee language. So I always hand this first handout out, and what we do is we go through it, and I pronounce the alphabet, and the class follows me, and then we go through the whole alphabet. Then we go through it again, but we all say it together. So that's how we're going to get started tonight. So the rest of you, you all know the routine, so we'll get started and everybody else join in as well. We'll starting with the first alphabet. A, G, E, V, H, I, G, L, M, N, O, P, K, C, D, U, A, W, Y. Okay, and we'll go back through it, but this time we're all going to say it together. I know I can always tell the good speakers because they said it with me the first time. <laughs> okay, y'all ready? A, G, E, F, H, I, G, L, M, N, O, P, L, C, D, U, A, W, Y. One of the things that I want to encourage this this part of the class is that we've been doing this every month. Has anyone feel like have you made attempt to memorize that alphabet? Camille, have you memorized it? Have you? Do you feel confident enough to try to say it? No. Yeah. Mhm. Mm Let's do that next month. And for the rest of you sitting there, okay, I've got a challenge to you. I want you to take this this time. Don't just take it home, put it on a coffee table, but I want you to study it and I want you to memorize it because we've said it enough. You all understand how to say it and you know how to pronounce it. One of the things that I do when I teach my classes is I use phonetics. I break the word down by using English, oh, what do you call that, uh, uh, like, for example, the ah, ah, as in ayo, ayo, chi, as in chapki, e, as in weasel, fi, as in figi, he, as in huspi, ai, as in laigira, ki, as in Kuwegi. Li as in Ligurhi. Mi as in Miski. Ni as in Niti. O as in Wotko. Pi as in Pasko. Si as in Sato. Si as in Sui sui. T as in totka. U as in totkuzi. A as in natki. We as in wasko. Ye as in yakpi. So that's how we use phonetics. We use, um, you, you see the parentheses. I've got it broke down by syllable. That's the word I'm looking for. You break it down by syllable and people makes it easier to understand. Look at those things in, uh, the, uh, that are outlined there and they're broke down by syllable and you can read it a lot better that way. We've been studying different things one night. I think our subject was foods. Uh, just different. We got a different theme every month. But last week we were talking, I had, uh, I had already had it on my mind, uh, uh, something about clans. And uh, somebody mentioned clans that night. And uh, so I think it's important because not only do we try to learn the language here at this class, we also try to deal with cultural subjects that, like for example, last month we had a presentation 
uh, from a guy that made Muscogee pottery, traditional Muscogee pottery. This month we got uh, people singing our traditional hymns. And so we try to keep the cultural aspect going as well. And so uh, I think it's important to discuss this matter about clans because uh, it's very, it is very core to our uh, identity as Muscogee people. Uh, it's something that, and, and some of you might wonder, uh, what's the difference in a clan and tribal towns? Remember this, tribal town is a political designation. Tribal town is something that you're a member of by virtue of the political group that you belong to. If you all remember the Muscogee government, Muscogee Creek government before 1970, in that old government, we were represented by tribal town. Okay, I belong to Tukabuchi. And uh, all we had a representative of the to the Creek government from Tukabuchi tribal town. Everybody else, Wilgofki, Alabama, Arshilanabi, everybody had their own representatives. But we changed that in 1970 and made representation by district and did away with that tribal town designation. But because of that, a lot of people forgot what their tribal town they did. You know, and the way that we get our tribal town is matrilineal. We're a matrilineal society. We get our identities. But remember, once again, that's a political designation. That's how come in the Dawes Rolls, if y'all look, ever look at the Dawes Rolls, and you look at your ancestor, it'll tell you his name, his age, his degree of blood, and his tribal town. But it don't say nothing about clan. Because clan is the traditional identity. It's not political, it's traditional. So they didn't include that in the Dawes Rolls. That's something that's handed down to us. That's something that it's not for the government to worry about what our tribal, uh, what our uh, clan is. That's for our families to tell us. That's for your grandpa and grandma to tell you. Just like the tribal town, but this is non-political designation. That started in prehistory, prehistorically. As a matter of fact, clan identity, according to legend, according to the legend that I know, was created the very day that man was created. Before there was any Muscogee, there was just people. Ixtizadi, red men. And I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you the, the legend that I've been taught. My grandfather was very knowledgeable, very, very knowledgeable culturally of traditional things. And, and uh, he knew stories. And he grew up in a traditional home. I've, told, I've talked to you all about my grandfather before. He lived in both worlds for the first part of his life. He was born, and from the second he was born, he was already designated to be a medicine man. He, they, was, they already said this is going to be a medicine man. He was raised specially. Those of you that know, Paul Kittler's his kid, Nancy, they raised him special. They didn't raise him like the other kids. He didn't get to run and play with all the other kids. As they were growing up, they didn't get to eat with the same utensils as everybody else. They were taught by elders too and they were kept away from a lot of the other kids' activities because they were already designated to be special people. I guess you could call it holy man. He's going to be a medicine man. And they were raised that way and they learned the, all the traditional ways and the teachings even from the time they was little. And while they were growing up, they went through that um, kind of special life and so when they already knew that's what he was going to be. So he was taught the songs and he was taught all of the teachings, uh, all of the laws, the, tr the traditional laws. They were taught all those things. And uh, so they knew that while they were growing up. And as I mentioned, they were kept away from a lot of other activities that a lot of people generally do, kids get to do. And so when he grew up, he just knew that's what he was going to be. And his, as he was taught, he became a medicine man. 
He not only was he a medicine man, but he was also a traditional speaker. And even traditional speakers, traditionally, I don't know about these days, but even when they was young, they started teaching them. They set them right down next to the speaker. And they set him down, and he, at the ceremonials, he grew up with the elders. And so, uh, by the time, and this, and they taught him, this is how you speak. And they did, they learned it. So by the time they got older, they just naturally knew. That's the kind of life he lived. His mother was matriarch at Alabama Stomp Ground. And uh, she, uh, her, the whole family was traditional. There was no uh, Christian family at all. And then in his life, in the 19, I think it was early 1940s, he was converted converted to Christianity and he became a preacher and he was already I mean natural speaker but he learned that Bible and he became a preacher and uh, he was one of the most traditional people that I knew to be a Baptist minister he didn't do away with the ceremonial ground he still went to ceremonial ground once a year he come before the church and he told him he said when it's time for green corn I'm a Dick and y'all give me leave, and I've got to go take care of my uh, uh, traditional spirit. And they would. They would. Marilyn Scott sitting right here. She went to the same church I did. He would come before the church, and we had a pastor named Kozi Hazo, and he would announce himself and say, "Next week, I'm going to be out," and they would give him they would give him permission, and uh, so he would go to the ceremonial ground. And uh, and take his medicine, and but then when that week was over, he'd come back, and they brought him back into fellowship, and he grew up that way. He taught me something that was very very important to me. Y'all y'all hear some of these young people arguing about church and ceremonial ground and saying things to each other and things like that. So was I doing? He said, "Don't listen to him." Because he shall get a machine, leg it with. But Mr. Tolkien, stove as I say, you do what he do it. How you are, is the head kid. But I say, Zach, do as an. But me, that fool, he got it with. In other words, God didn't turn his back on our people just because Columbus wasn't here yet. That's the same God they was worshiping, that they worship today, and that we're worshiping at church. So don't say nothing about ceremonial people and don't say nothing about Christian people because there's no wrong. Just one God. He taught me that and I firmly believe that. So when I hear these young people arguing with each other, I just don't pay attention to it because they don't know that, that God is for everybody. So I learned that kind of thing. And let's go back to what our traditional identity is. The clans. I'm going to tell you this legend that he told me. And, and it holds true to me today. That uh, you know everybody has a creation story. We talk about Adam and Eve in the Bible. And different tribes they say they have their own creation story. But for Muscogee people. There was a time when there was only the earth. There was only the earth. And there was animals and there was trees, and there was water, but there was no people. But people, Ofunga, or Ishagadamzi, or God, whatever you want to call him in your own words, he saw the need that people would be on this earth. So he started forming people inside of the earth, out of the clay, and out of the earth. And when he got his people ready, he opened up a hole, and my grandpa called it <clears throat> in other words, the backbone of the earth. He said that a cave came open on top of the backbone of the earth, which is, he, he said, he understands it to be the, 
Rocky Mountains, the great Rocky Mountains, that a hole came open, a cave came open, and people, the people that were created by old fungus started coming out of the earth. But at that time, there was a great fog covering the earth. It was so thick you couldn't see five feet in front of you. And these people, the first Muscogee people came out of the earth. They were afraid because they couldn't see. So they gathered in small groups and they held on to one, one another. Small groups of them. And that small group would go over here after they came out. Another small group would go over here hanging on to each other. And till all these groups came out of the earth and there were a bunch of groups <coughs> and then Ufunga he saw that these people were lost and they didn't know what to do so he took a great breath took a deep breath and he blew that fog away and when he blew the fog away all of a sudden the sunlight shone through and all the people could see all around them this group way over here, this group way over here. The very first group that came out of that ground, I don't know how many there were, but that first group that was hanging on to each other, they honored Ofunga's breath. They honored, his, they honored Ofunga by naming themselves the Wind People, Wind Clan, Hudalgogi, because that was God's breath that blew that away so they could see. We'll name ourselves after that wind. So we'll call ourselves wind people. The second group came out and they said, you know, we, uh, we sustained ourselves while we was underground, while we were still in the earth. We wouldn't have made it if Ofunga didn't provide sustenance. In other words, something for us to eat. What they ate before they came out of the ground was potatoes. Ofunga put potatoes in their path underground so they could find it and dig it out. And that's what they ate. That's what kept them alive until they came out of the ground. Moment. Word for potato is aha. If you'll follow my... Uh, lesson plan right there. I'm kind of going along there. Uh-huh. Uh, and so they call themselves Aha uh Lagogi. -huh. We're going to honor what Ofunga did for us by giving us sustenance. Aha Lagogin. So they name themselves Aha uh -huh or potato people. Some people say sweet potato. That's up to you. But all I ever heard was potato. From thereafter, the small groups looked around and the first animal they saw, they named themselves after. Not necessarily in this order, but say, for example, bird clan, Fuswalgi, or people of the bird, Fuswa. Fuswa is the root word meaning bird. And Izuwalgi, or Chuwalgi, deer clan. That group saw a deer. That's the first animal they saw. And it went on down the line. Bear clan, Nogosalgi. Raccoon clan, Wotkalgi. Otter clan, Ushanalgi. Tiger or panther clan. We call it tiger, but it's really panther. Kachalgi or Kacha. Alligator clan, Holbaralgi. Fox clan, Chulaalgi. Skunk clan, Kunibalgi. Those are the names of the clans that I've heard. I've met people, actually, that call themselves after these clans. They, they'll tell you, that's my clan. There are some more clans listed in the Martin Malden Dictionary. I went ahead and put them down here. I don't guess I've ever met anybody from these clans, but the, it's in there, so I'm not going to doubt it. The uh, Cain clan, Kohazalgi, which is named after Koha, meaning Cain. A goat clan, Chuwarelgi, or Chuwara. I kind of doubted that one. I thought, Chuwara? Our people didn't know Chuwara. 
But you know what? If my grandpa's legend holds true and they came out of the great Rocky Mountains, there's goats in the Rocky Mountains. So that makes sense. Chihuahua. Hikrinut clan, Uji Elgi, which comes from the root word Uji. Salt clan, Okchanwalgi, from Okchanwa. Snake clan, Chitalgi, from Chitto. These last two I didn't I didn't recognize, but it was listed, so I went ahead and put them on there. Tamulgi and Waksalgi. Waksalgi. I think I misspelled that first word. It's L K I, not K L I. Waksalgi. I've I've heard people say that, but I never heard anybody say they were Waksalgi. I'm going to go around the room, and and don't be embarrassed if you don't know. But I think it's great to know that there's a lot of people here that we still know what they are. I'm I'm Fuswogi. I'm a bird clan. Nancy. Izwogi or Chuelgi. Chuelgi. Hudolgogi, wind clan. Bunny. Fuswogi. That's my brother. <laughs> Marilyn. Chuelgi. Fuswa. Hudolgi? Ketoga? Oh, okay. Hudolgi? Hudolgi? No, was it? Pushwa? Huh? Pushwalgi? You don't know? It's a gotcha. Hulbarogi. David? Izuelgi. Huh? Katsogi. That's great. Nogozogi. Marcia? Nogozogi. Pozwalgi. Nogozi. Kisi? Katsa. Just a minute. There's seven clans in the Cherokee Nation. You know what clan you are? Oh, Choctaw side. Okay. Do they? They don't have clans Choctaw, do they? My aunt told me that uh, we were uh, Tunisistic. Which is skunk. Skunk, okay. Bear clan. Bear clan. Nogozogi. Pushwogi. Katsogi. Okay. You know, that's, that's, it's good that so many people still know that. Our next generation below us, though, I wonder how many of them know that, you know. The next thing I want to talk about is our relations. You know, it's, they set that up. Our people set that up for a reason. You know, Stet Gogi, they, they put a lot of stock into genealogy about knowing who your great, 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 great grandpa was. That's good to know. And for us, we can do that pretty much back to the Dawes Rolls, but before that, it's hard to trace our ancestry. But you know, we talk about that. For traditional people, that wasn't important. That wasn't the important thing. Who your blood relations way back down the line, that wasn't important. It's good to know who your family is. It's good to know who your brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles and cousins are. But what's more important to Muscogee people is who your clan relations are. That's what dictated our relationships with one another. Pushwal you don't know this che. Hukdin Hoboich Kinwat. Hugida Rosin, Hukdin Hoboid Alitahe, Hobochinat, Pushwalgi Abagi Guru Abahansi Guru. That's your sister, Jarai Hosiman. Shtimabu has a gilta orajan, Jarai Hosiriman Nora. Don't marry within your clan because that's considered incest. So you're supposed to look outside your clan. And whatever offspring that you have, they always follow the mother's clan. So if I'm a Fuswa, that means my mother was Fuswa. It just so happened that my dad was too, but that was just coincidence. Um, another thing too is that, you know, uh, for some of you that, 
grew up in traditional homes or traditional background, we have regard for one another based on our clan clan identity. <clears throat> he was Aktayachi. And so everybody that's Aktayachi, and that's pretty still pretty prevalent, uh, clan. That's my grandfathers. I consider them grandfathers. I have to honor them. And the same way, if my father had been different, whatever his clan was, I have to honor them people. That's, that's the purpose of a clan identity. So that's why we get that. Uh, that that's why that was set up like that. My, uh, as I mentioned a while ago, these, these are the clans that are listed uh, in the Martin and Malden. The ones that I know are in the middle. Uh, the spelling for that particular clan is right there to the right. And the, and the root word of that is over to the right of that. That's how we, uh, you, you might have had experiences while you were growing up of your parents or grandparents setting you down and explaining to you what clans were for and why they were there. And uh, one other thing I wanted to mention is that our ceremonial people, they follow that clan identity more closely because your standing in the ceremonial ground depends on what your clan is. If you are a certain clan, you are the you may be the only one eligible to be Miku. Because in our ceremonial uh, grounds, only certain clans can hold those positions. So that's what is followed real closely. I know, for example, Tugabuchi uh, was a Wutku. Wutku was the only one could be the chief. But these days, I think maybe we're getting away from that a little bit. But a lot of our ceremonial grounds had those same laws. So that's what, that was the purpose of these clan identities. All right. Well, that's, uh, that's my presentation for this evening. Has anybody got any comments regarding clans that you thought might have sparked your interest? Anything that you were told or anything that you want to mention about clan identities? I'm, I'm, I'm. I'm delighted to know everybody knows so much about the clans. Uh, Nancy, didn't you tell me you had some, something you might want to add to the, the clan discussions when we were talking? Did you want to say something about clan, clan or Futsa? Yeah. Same grandma? Mm -hmm. Good. You know, this in my generation, even though I was 
when I was little, I wasn't raised in a, a ceremonial uh, background. My people were still real traditional, even though they were, were church people. A lot of our church people were, because they stuck close to that clan identity, and they taught those things, you know. And uh, so we, I was lucky enough that my grandfather knew all that he did and taught those things. That's another thing I wanted to mention, that uh, some of us here, uh, Nancy's, Na I'm related to Nancy, and uh, we're, we're descended directly from Hobitia Hula. My, uh, my grandfather was a beaver. His last name was Beaver. And uh, the beavers and Yeholas and gouges. And uh, there are several descendants of Hubiliola directly. And uh, I'm one of those descendants. And so I, all the gouges, and uh, they're all related to me as well. So, David. Edwin, I had a question after bringing up uh, Hubiliola. Uh, I think it was Felix who told me that name had something to do with the fog. Who we need, yeah. Name, and is, is there any way tie into the, the, what you were telling us about the fog? One of, one of the, well, I want to say this. More than likely, uh, I don't know what his clan was, but a lot of times traditional names, when you were given a traditional name, it was based on your clan a lot of times. So somebody might be called Katsa Yehola or Nohoz Yehola or something like that. It's because they're clan. In his case, Hubili Yahola, I'm wondering if uh, it had something to do with uh, uh, Hudalgi or Hudali. He might have been a wind clan. I don't know. Uh, so uh, I, that's, that's the closest thing that I could think of about that. One of the things that he had several children. Some of them took his Yahola name, uh, Hubili Yahola. And one of his children was uh, Icha. Icha Jehula is, is uh, one of his sons. And so when they, the government, the American government started translating our names into English names, some people, they, they gave them proper, what do they call them, Christian names or something like that. Some of them, some of the children took the Jehola name. Icha Jehola, his some of his children took the beaver side, beaver name, uh, Icha Jehola. And so that's how my grandpa, like Perry Beaver and them, they're also descendants. Perry Beaver's family and our family, that's where the beaver came in. But Well, I think that's about all I had this evening, David. Um, I thank you all for coming out. I, I'm especially delighted to have this group here from Ogmulgee. I know that uh, they're, they come a long way and, and they've done a lot of things, and I'm really proud of them for the work that they do. And I think I want to also acknowledge Nancy here that this, uh, even though uh, Bunny told us how this group got started, Nancy also started a group for, uh, it's something that was really unheard of. And it was a support group for widows, Muscogee widows, called Hoktagi Oiyogi, which means widow, uh, widowed women, uh, a support group. And Ishtizari Hoktagi Oiyogi, which means native women. Uh, support group and so I thought that was a great thing and I think she's still going strong there's I don't think I don't know maybe there's other groups like it I'm, I've never heard of it but I hear that now there's a lot of other groups looking at their group and saying we want to do that too within other tribes so I want I wanted to commend Nancy for that and for keeping it going you know because it's a tough road for a woman that's that's been widowed and uh, so I understand that so uh, how you? I don't get a measles cow. My you get they don't dance is. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, David.
Concrete Glasses by Jackson Marley and he teaches us every Tuesday at 1 o'clock right there at the center. We've been doing this since June. That's okay. why I do a lot of the work. He's taught us a lot. Of yeah, uh, I actually, I think Jackson used to teach us at the whole thing years ago. And I, I had a chance to sit in on some of the classes. So All right, thanks for letting us know about that. All right, my obligation is over to in this year's second group, we've got no day one on up uh, 90 something years old that come. And one of the people who comes is a little much in your era. And she leads great songs, and I'm really proud of her. You know? and we have several other young ones, and they talk, they, they want to lead songs, you know. And you know, that really brings joy to my heart because a lot of our, our youth are bashful or whatever, they don't learn. So we're willing to learn anything and everything. But like I said, we're all old folks and we have to put her old. She's going to leave the next song. Oh. 
song will be led by Mr. Pearl. And it's one of the dismissal songs that we always sing at the end of our services or wherever we get together. <coughs> last song we say. And again, if you don't know, you know, understand these, these three hymns, you, know, you can buy them here. Christ's book and it's got the interpretation of what we're singing, you know. It's good, to, it's good to know what you're singing, you know. I know even if you don't know, sometimes you can may feel that spirit in these songs because they are scriptural, you know. But when you know what you're what we're saying, that it helps you a lot more. So you can buy these books. I know at our gift shop they have they may have them here somewhere. I don't know. And again, I'd like to like to thank you all for inviting us up here. And again, remember our Thursday night date is the third Thursday of every month. So we invite you to come with us. It's going to be a part of it. And be sure to come, you really enjoy it. Still at home because there's always new people, new faces. Nobody's a stranger. We're all friendly people here, you know. And they look mean, but they're, they're good people. We just laugh and joke like we're just one big family all the time. Anyway, we'll take a couple more songs and we'll close it out. Pray our hands.
thank you so much for all the fellowship we have had and some of the people that we've met and the fine food, Father. And uh, as everybody departs from these premises, Father, we pray that family's great and they will arrive home safely. Again, to be our will, Father, we'll see each other once again, but if not, we'll meet each other in every home. But you have a fair and fresh man. So again, Father, we say everything to the precious man. We just give you all the praise, honor, and glory.